So I want to continue talking today about uh, land use and this special problem that we face in managing land use and development uh, in the coastal zone. Uh, why the coastal zone? Well, for several really important reasons. One is that it's under enormous development pressure. People uh, uh, <coughs> often want to live in urban areas. They, they uh, all often want to live uh, in coastal environments. But also, a coastal zone is experiencing uh, increased risk uh, of damage from storms, uh, sea level rise, uh, and increased pollution that's also associated with density. So I want to talk uh, today about the variety of strategies that might be used uh, to control development uh, in the coastal zone. So uh, this, uh, I thought I'd start out with a little cartoon. Good news, at the current rate of global warming, we should be able to, to uh, just swim over there and eat them in under five years. So within the world, 640, 650 million people live in the coastal zone uh, that uh, are at some risk of, of uh, property loss or, or uh, injury from intense storms. And the 10 countries with the largest number of people living in vulnerable low elevation uh, coastal zones include China, India, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Indonesia, Japan, Egypt, the US, Thailand, and the Philippines. So that the, the overwhelming majority of people uh, that uh, live in the coastal zone in the world uh, do not have the capacity to, to manage uh, the hazards that they face. And uh, <coughs> Uh, the, the variety of, of uh, legal and economic strategies that might be used to, to uh, uh, prevent serious damage is the subject of the lecture. So the growth of cities uh, in the coastal zone uh, is a si significant issue to pay attention to. So that on average, coastal cities are growing 20% faster than any other cities in the world. Uh, and they have 10 to 15% higher densities than other cities. And of the 20 megacities in the world, 15, 15 of them are in coastal areas. Now, within the US, we have a, a statute called the Coastal Zone Management Act. Uh, and the act is administered by the National o Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, and it provides for management of the nation's coastal zones, uh, uh, as well as the resources found there. Uh, and it includes the Great Lakes, as well as uh, the, the sea coast. And it, it's designed to balance economic development and promote economic development at the same time that it promotes economic cons or environmental conservation. So it has a tension built into the mission statement of, of the statute. Now, <clears throat> there was great debate uh, within the Nixon administration about the structure of this statute and, and what kind of teeth would be put into it uh, should the federal government get uh, involved in the regulation of land use, uh, the way that uh, the state of New York got involved in the regulation of private land use in the Adirondacks. Uh, and the, uh, there were forces inside the, the Nixon administration, uh, Republican administration, you recall, <coughs> that uh, argued quite extensively that uh, we needed to protect land areas in the, in the coastal zone <coughs> and that uh, uh, the cost to the nation in terms of, of uh, bearing liability and responsibility for rebuilding damaged areas uh, was growing and uh, was going to be uh, potentially overwhelming. So that the overall uh, objectives are conflicting uh, and include the phrase preserve, protect, develop, and where possible to restore or enhance the resources of the nation's coastal zone. We also have a, 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 a coincidental uh, uh, statute that's created the National Flood Insurance Program, uh, but that program is now essentially bankrupt. Uh, so the, the Federal Flood Insurance Program faces major financial difficulties. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, particularly as the Gulf Coast recovers, it's essentially bankrupt. Uh, the, the Federal Emergency Management uh, Agency officials estimate that Hurricane Katrina and Rita uh, together would result in flood insurance claims of about $23 billion. Well, it turns out that uh, when you to total up the costs of, of uh, uh, emergency response, uh, property uh, restoration, uh, the, uh, the uh, health care requirements associated with uh, these two storms, uh, it's not $23 billion, it's in the hundreds of billions of dollars uh, that the U.S. Uh, government expended. So <clears throat> should coastal property be insured by the public sector? Uh, what kinds of uh, alternatives might there be? And uh, the Federal Flood Insurance Program has encouraged people uh, uh, to uh, build in the coastal areas uh, that are at risk and it offers them uh, a subsidized uh, low rate of insurance uh, so that in the event of storm damage, uh, property damage, uh, flooding, uh, the, the uh, uh, government steps in uh, 
and basically uh, provides low-cost insurance so people rebuild. So what are the variety of management strategies that you might use, the, uh, the different kinds of legal instruments? Well, there are certain questions that you, you might address. You know, how should we uh, go about uh, protecting open lands in the coastal area? Uh, should they be public? Should they be private? Uh, should we employ land use regulation? Uh, should it be uh, uh, managed by uh, local governments, as it traditionally has been through much of the 20th century, uh, state governments, uh, or should the federal government step in? And I'll give you a couple of examples over the next uh, 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 45 minutes uh, that will show you uh, uh, how the federal government has stepped in and applied eminent domain uh, to purchase up open areas and resources that uh, the government thought were particularly valuable, uh, not just because of, of their ecological characteristics, uh, but also because they provided recreational opportunities, uh, particularly in vicinity of, of these population centers. So <clears throat> insurance, uh, whether or not uh, the insurance program should be uh, uh, continued, uh, or whether or not the subsidy should be removed, uh, this is an open question. How about transferable development rights? I'll speak about this in a few moments, but uh, the idea behind transferable development rights is that you have a, a uh, uh, source zone uh, so that if a, a zone is set up, a zoning scheme is set up, uh, and one area is more restricted uh, uh, to, to uh, limit development than another area, uh, the restricted area uh, might uh, have some sort of a scheme where they could uh, transfer a credit uh, to develop. Uh, to another area or a receiving zone. So you might think about it as having a, a sending zone and a, and a receiving zone uh, and <clears throat> so that if you are restricted you can't build on your property because you're lying within a floodplain, you're lying uh, uh, say adjacent to a wetland or uh, next to the shoreline, uh, then you don't lose your property value. So that this idea of transferable development rights uh, doesn't end run around uh, the, the question about uh, compensation. Uh, so that uh, uh, it avoids the, the, uh, the, the possibility of, of litigation uh, based upon the Fifth Amendment that uh, we described and went through on Tuesday. So <clears throat> uh, thinking about, I uh, see I've repeated insurance twice here, uh, thinking about the idea of easements so that uh, the government could go into an area and buy up some of the development rights but uh, not all of it. So, so uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the complete bundle of rights uh, might be broken up into bits and pieces. You could also imagine a statute that uh, would employ a variety of different uh, tax schemes. They might be property uh, tax related so that uh, property taxes could be uh, elevated in areas that uh, are especially valuable uh, and they might be lower in areas that are further uh, away from the coast outside of the, the hazard zone. Uh, and you might think also about income tax credits. I mean, what if you uh, received an income tax credit when you purchased property uh, that uh, was in a low risk area? or in an area that uh, had lower resource values. Uh, and also the, the idea of payment for ecosystem services. Now, what, what would that mean? What are ecosystem services? Well, I mean, the coastal, uh, coastal zone in its natural condition uh, plays many different valuable roles. Uh, and I'll show you some photos in a, in a, in a moment that uh, demonstrate the, the flood storage capacity, uh, but also the biological diversity is, is often uh, higher in, in coastal areas. And, uh, also, uh, recreational opportunities, uh, marine fisheries, the commercial uh, value of coastal zone is extremely important. Uh, nearly 75% of, of marine fisheries are, 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 uh, that are, are commercially uh, uh, caught uh, spend some portion of their life in uh, uh, coastal estuaries, uh, in, in uh, wetlands areas. Uh, and, and many of the uh, coastlines uh, of the United States, they're, they're uh, ringed by thin bands of sand uh, that are known as barrier islands. And these barriers uh, basically act to, uh, to protect uh, the inland areas uh, from, from uh, intense storm damage. So that uh, uh, thinking about uh, uh, the variety of uh, uh, protective services and, and recreational and commercial opportunities, uh, in addition to the property value uh, opportunities that most local governments are looking at, uh, and why would that be? Well, local governments uh, get their primary source of tax revenue uh, to uh, offer all of their services uh, predominantly uh, based upon the valuation of property. So as development increases in any town, in any municipality, uh, it offers increased opportunity for uh, a local or a municipal government to secure additional taxes. So payments for ecosystem services, now what, what, what might that be? Well, uh, supposing uh, you have uh, someone who, 
who uh, wants to uh, develop in a, in a wetland area uh, and you <coughs> have created a regulation or a statute that offers specific protection uh, of wetlands. And, and wetlands are, are protected uh, in the United States under the Clean Water Act if they're uh, adjacent to uh, a navigable waterway. Uh, but many states have also adopted their own protective uh, wetland statutes and make, many local governments have, have also filed suit. So uh, these areas that uh, are seasonally wet uh, or marshy or parts of estuaries, th they get special legal attention in the United States. So <clears throat> now imagine that uh, you decided that you wanted to uh, curtail any future development in a wetland or in a, an endangered species habitat. Uh, and <clears throat> or in a uh, in a flood zone. Well, basically, uh, if somebody wanted to develop there, uh, you might give them a credit uh, so that they could do that. Uh, they they may have to pay extra, uh, and that money could go into a bank, uh, basically an ecosystem service bank. And there are now banks uh, that have been created in the United States and in different parts of the world where developers uh, are developing in sensitive areas. They're allowed to do that, but they have to pay into this bank and then. Uh, that money is used to, to uh, restore uh, uh, resources that have been degraded, uh, perhaps in the same watershed, perhaps in the same municipality, uh, or the uh, uh, funds might be uh, used to purchase land uh, to, to uh, uh, offer greater protection. And the trade is uh, rarely uh, conducted on an on a acre per acre or, or hectare per hectare basis. Uh, normally, uh, you require the developer to pay for protection uh, at some multiple of the, the uh, scale of the original development. So <clears throat> it might be a uh, one for three or a one for four acre trade. The developer gets to, to develop one acre, but then he's literally financing the protection of another area. So this, uh, this form of uh, credit uh, uh, creation and, and uh, purchase and, and banking, it's becoming much more common around the world. And, and if you think about uh, uh, the similarity to this between uh, the cap and trade idea that we discussed when we were talking about the Clean Air Act uh, and the sulfur dioxide provisions. Remember that uh, in the north, uh, in the Ohio Valley and uh, up, up through uh, the northeastern United States, you had uh, uh, this cap put on CO2 emission allowances uh, for all the power plants. So, <clears throat> and that allowed uh, a, a trading scheme to evolve so that uh, the, the uh, uh, as the uh, ceiling for total allowable SO2 diminished, uh, it made the uh, 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 allowances uh, much more valuable. So that uh, those that uh, could, could uh, those that uh, uh, emitted the, the lowest levels of SO2 uh, received uh, credits that they could then sell to uh, those industries uh, that wanted to keep polluting. They didn't want to invest in the technology, perhaps a, a scrubber. So this idea is is, is uh, you know very similar to what's being discussed with respect to to uh, carbon trading, but, but also it has great similarity to these other concepts about ecosystem services. So that uh, it's, the, the underlying requirement is that there has to be some sort of a, a legal threshold uh, that's easily identifiable and some sort of a trading uh, formula that, that is set up in, in order for these to be functional. So here's a suite of, of, of different kinds of, of management uh, alternatives. Now, as you think about uh, the vulnerability uh, of, of uh, property and, and life in, in the coastal zone, I, wa I want you to be thinking about it uh, ecologically. I want you to think about uh, you know, what principles uh, of ecology or, or understanding of, of ecosystems and how they're structured and function and how they change over time. What principles should you have in mind uh, as you're thinking about selection among these different strategies? And I think that uh, one of the intellectual pioneers of this idea of tying uh, the science of ecology uh, with law that would, would uh, somehow control the way that we use land, uh, it was pioneered by Ian McCarg, a, a uh, relatively famous uh, landscape architect at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, the individual that uh, really I, I give credit to for inspiring me to, uh, to do what I do uh, with my life. Uh, now I want you to think uh, just carefully about uh, population concentrations in the United States just swirling uh, uh, quickly here. Here's Boston, Massachusetts, uh, Providence, Rhode Island, New York City. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, San Francisco. Uh, so that, uh, you know, think about uh, the, the density of, of property and population that lives in, in the coastal zone. So that uh, if you calculate the proportion of the U.S. population uh, that, that lives in coastal counties, it's now over 50% of the U.S. population that lives in these uh, shaded areas. 
and the areas of, of most rapid growth uh, include the northeastern part of the U.S., particularly southern New Hampshire and, and uh, uh, Cape Cod, uh, also Long Island, uh, but parts of Maryland, and uh, also Florida. And Florida is experiencing just a, a continued enormous growth. 25% uh, of the uh, vacation homes in the United States are now owned in, in Florida. And I'm going to pause here, and I, I hope that this works. Uh, I'm going to pause here to uh, see if I can uh, call up Google Earth, because many of you uh, perhaps uh, have not been to Florida, uh, but uh, I'll take you on just a, a very quick Google Earth uh, Cook's tour of the, uh, of the coastline. <clears throat> First starting out in uh, <clears throat> the Miami Beach area, and here as we, as we zone in, uh, you, you begin to see the intensity of development, but you also <clears throat> are looking at a barrier island. This is one of those thin strands of, of sand in this case, maybe a quarter to uh, a third of a, a mile in width, <coughs> that, that uh, in its natural form, uh, it, it buffers, it buffers uh, the energy from waves and storms uh, so that, it, that uh, that energy doesn't uh, normally affect the, uh, the bay shore uh, over, over uh, here. So that, that uh, this barrier island wants to migrate in a landward direction. So this poses a really interesting kind of a legal problem. You know, if you're managing a, a, uh, the, the development uh, of, of an Adirondack uh, mountain, uh, you don't have the, the same uh, ecological dynamic going on as you do here, because this is basically just a big pile of sand. Uh, and it's shaped by wind, it's shaped by, by waves, <coughs> and uh, basically it wants to, literally wants to roll over itself uh, in a landward direction. So if you take a look at uh, uh, say, uh, Cape Hatteras or, or uh, Assateague Island or some of the other national parks uh, that have been uh, established on these barrier islands, uh, you'll actually see them migrating <coughs> in a landward direction, often at a rate of maybe uh, uh, two to, to four to five feet per year, depending upon storm intensity. So, <coughs> and in, a, in a natural condition, you would see uh, in the bay, you'd see uh, uh, wetlands and it would be a very active uh, uh, nursery for a variety of commercial marine species, as I mentioned earlier. But uh, as, you, as you zone in, what you can see here is that the property values in, in urban uh, areas have just gone so high that the intensity of development is really quite remarkable. So that uh, Miami Beach, of course, you have the, the, the hotels right on the beach uh, with the, uh, the cabanas on the beach. And <clears throat> as, you, as you move further north, you see that uh, uh, the sandy area <clears throat> was transformed into a golf course. And uh, over here uh, in the Sunset Islands area, uh, just think about uh, what this used to be. This used to be a salt marsh. Uh, and the salt marsh was basically transformed by dredging up uh, the wetland areas, the estuary, and piling up that uh, soil and bringing in concrete and other materials uh, to create uh, these remarkable little communities. So uh, <clears throat> people are able to drive to these communities and uh, uh, also park their boats there so that uh, each one of these artificial islands has created uh, you know, roughly 75 to 100 different lots uh, at an average price, selling price in the 1970s, 80s, and 1990s uh, that was <coughs> approaching a, a, a million dollars. So just to buy the property alone, uh, at, at regardless of the cost of, of building, uh, would, would cost a million dollars. So that uh, uh, <coughs> developers uh, were given the license to uh, basically do what they wanted on the barrier island. Uh, and if you look uh, further north along the Florida coastline, uh, you see that uh, the majority of Florida's coastline has these barrier islands on it. So uh, <coughs> I, uh, I was going to take you on a, a, a flight over this. I don't know if any of you have played with, with a flight simulator on Google, but. Uh, I decided against doing that uh, in the lecture because I end up uh, spending more time underwater with a plane than, than on the surface. Uh, but uh, here you can see the, the, uh, the barriers, uh, you know, variable in, in intensity. But Miami Beach uh, uh, is probably the, the most intensely developed barrier island uh, in the U.S., if, if not the world. So I'll pause back out of this and head back to uh, the lecture. And also the, uh, <coughs> the development in California uh, in the southern part of the state uh, is some of the most rapid uh, that, that we've seen, although uh, the, the recent housing crisis has, has uh, slowed that. Now, I want you to think also uh, a bit about uh, 
technological solutions because uh, there, there are many, many engineering solutions to, to uh, protect against uh, loss of life. And following a, a very intense storm uh, where tens of thousands of people lost their life in Great Britain and also the Netherlands uh, back in the early 1950s, a project was initiated uh, called the Delta Works. And uh, the Delta Works uh, basically built uh, seawalls and, and dikes uh, that uh, uh, those in the Netherlands are, are quite famous for. And uh, they're very effective. So here's the, uh, the largest seawall in the world uh, that, uh, so that it's triggered, it, it closes automatically uh, when, when the uh, sea level rises up uh, uh, a certain number of feet. And here's the, uh, the Thames barrier designed to protect uh, London against flooding from, from uh, severe storms as well. So there are a variety of, of different technological solutions that are extraordinarily expensive, uh, but given the property value, uh, that uh, exists and is at risk in the coastal zone, these are likely to be in our future in, in, uh, in U.S. Uh, urban areas. Uh, and think for a moment about uh, Hurricane Katrina. Again, uh, the, the, the low bound projection of the cost is, is roughly uh, cost of, of loss uh, to the public, $200 billion. The high bound is closer to a half of a trillion dollars. Uh, and <clears throat> part of the, the, uh, the loss was associated with the failure of the U.S. Corps of Engineers to uh, uh, make a decision that would raise the level of the dike uh, that would be protective for a Category 5 hurricane. Uh, they decided uh, when they were choosing among uh, different uh, uh, structural uh, design alternatives, they decided that they would build the seawall that would be protective only for a Category 3 to 4 storm. Uh, the reason being that they had the authority to make that decision by balancing costs versus benefits. So they reduce everything to cost versus benefit, and they basically concluded that the probability of, of a, uh, a Category 5, the uh, worst case scenario, uh, was exceptionally low. Here's an example of that dike uh, uh, breaking through and the school bus on the bottom being uh, flooded over. Now, uh, a, a different approach a different approach to this, rather than uh, using uh, high-tech solutions that are really expensive, uh, was, was being pursued by the U.S. back in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, a legal strategy uh, uh, that evolved in Congress uh, to create a variety of new national parks uh, that were then uh, uh, called national seashores. So uh, Cape Cod, for example, was one of the first national seashores after, after Cape Hatteras. And uh, so that you can imagine that uh, there are these private lands uh, and the government was trying to figure out, well, how can we affect, uh, effectively create a new national park in an area of private land, or an area that may be private land, or county lands, state lands. Uh, so there's a really a complex mixture of different public and private ownership pattern. Uh, but but uh, no, no federal presence uh, prior to 1961 to, to 63. So the Park Service was given the authority by Congress. Uh, this is uh, John F. Kennedy, uh, who, who signed the, the statute. Uh, and uh, his family being famous for their, their home in uh, Hyannis uh, on Cape Cod. Uh, very, family has been very protective of, of land use and development on Cape Cod. Uh, and and uh, uh, conservation groups have long thought that this was an area worthy of, of federal protection. So that the Park Service uh, was given the money and the authority by Congress to go in and buy up the land on, on Cape Cod, or, or part of the land on Cape Cod. And they decided to do that in, in a very interesting way. Uh, they decided to exclude areas such as the village centers, uh, whereas they would buy up the, the, the coastal areas uh, that offered, A, the most uh, uh, recreational opportunity. But interestingly, they also had the highest uh, property value, so that they were, in, in a sense, the most controversial. Uh, so recreational opportunity, uh, the, maintaining the, the uh, possibility of public access to the beach, which in New England and in the eastern part of the U.S. is extremely difficult to, to get to. So if you, you try to get to the beach in uh, coastal communities uh, here in Connecticut, you often have a hard time getting there uh, because you've got house after house after house uh, and you've got uh, fences put up so that uh, even though the state of, of Connecticut has adopted its own law that demands public access, this is no way close to the, the ethic and culture of public access that evolved in California. Uh, as well as in, in Oregon and in parts of Washington. So that uh, different parts of the country have uh, th these different uh, uh, cultural predispositions uh, to allow public access. So, you know, one, one way to think about uh, this problem is to think about, you know, which, uh, which private lands does the Park Service really want to own? Uh, 
Uh, do they really want to buy up somebody's house or do they want to buy up a commercial uh, shopping center? Uh, or do they want airports in, inside the park or outside the park? So there are many difficult des decisions that, that have to be made if you decide that you're going to use the power of eminent domain to go in and create a new national seashore or a new national park. So <laughs> this was all occurring, by the way, in an era uh, when climate change concern uh, was pretty much non-existent back in the 1960s. Uh, but it, it actually was a, a quite uh, uh, far-sighted in, in, uh, as, a, as a legal strategy uh, that we might learn lessons from today about uh, how we could manage other areas in the U.S. that uh, are, are relatively undeveloped. <clears throat> and if you look also at the ecological characteristics of the coastline here, uh, you can see the same kind of barrier spit, uh, but in the natural form uh, that, uh, that uh, existed down in uh, Miami, at Miami Beach, before that was, was uh, uh, intensively developed. Obviously, the, the, the uh, density is much, much lower here uh, than Miami Beach. But it gives you a sense of, of what uh, an ecosystem like this would look like in a relatively undisturbed form. So that the, the national seashore now extends uh, all the way to the tip of, of uh, Cape Cod, uh, up to uh, Provincetown. It includes about six communities with the most intensively developed areas uh, excluded from it. Now, the, the Cape Cod formula for land protection uh, was curious because it, it, it gave the government the power to use eminent domain to go in and take uh, private property. Uh, and eminent domain means that they would be compensated uh, for their value loss. And it's kind of curious because many property owners uh, realized that, uh, boy, you know, uh, <clears throat> now that people understood that the Park Service was buying up private lands, uh, property values were going through the roof. So, you know, whenever anybody wants to preserve land uh, and they have to buy up a number of parcels, then it really pays the, uh, uh, the last uh, holdout because property value is going to be uh, highest. And also these rates of, of property value increase were occurring at about 50% per year. So <clears throat> many, many people took uh, the Park Service to court and said, no, we're not going to give you our land, uh, even though compensation was being offered. Uh, so <clears throat> what they did was they were playing a game uh, watching property values increase, knowing that uh, the, the uh, market value that they would be provided for the property would be decided uh, once the court uh, had made its final decision. So eight, ten years later, if they could draw the, the, the litigation out over a decade, uh, when you have a 50% increase per, per year, that caused the Park Service uh, great anxiety uh, and made them uh, 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 increase their offer uh, to, uh, to settle. But it was a much more expensive venture uh, that took a, a lot more time uh, to accomplish. The, the Nature Conservancy has used a similar kind of strategy, but rather than going into an area such as the uh, Virginia Coastal Reserve, uh, <coughs> rather than going into the area and, and telling people, we're going to create a new uh, Nature Conservancy preserve here, uh, instead they set up a, a variety, uh, a large number of, of uh, separate dummy corporations. Uh, that uh, went in and purchased the tracks independently so that nobody really had a sense that there was one group coming in and they were uh, basically uh, creating this collective. And that whole strategy was designed to prevent uh, uh, people from delaying, from holding out, and trying to secure the benefit uh, that, that uh, the increased property value over time uh, <coughs> would provide. So uh, thinking also about uh, the, the, the dynamics of this environment and why it's different than an upland area, uh, say in, in uh, central New York or, or central Connecticut. Uh, th the energy that uh, uh, is, is uh, pushing against uh, uh, a barrier such as, as uh, Miami Beach or Assateague Island is coming predominantly from uh, two sources. One is wind and one is waves. Actually, the sand shifts around more uh, in response uh, to wind because uh, prevailing winds uh, push the, the sand up and, and uh, uh, the, the central stabilizing force of a barrier island uh, is nothing more than, than a blade of grass. And uh, on Cape Cod, uh, as in just one example, uh, the, the kind of seagrass that they have, uh, mar uh, the, the uh, dune grass that they have, it often grows up uh, maybe uh, a meter in height, uh, but it also sends roots down about a meter in height so that it can withstand uh, a lot of overwash by storm waves. Uh, at the same time, it plays a function of building up these dunes because it just reduces uh, the, the wind velocity in the vicinity of the, of the, of the grass blades uh, down to a level, uh, I think I recall it at 17 miles an hour uh, on Cape Cod. So the, the, the grains of sand are blowing uh, across uh, uh, the beach and they hit the, the seagrass and they settle. Uh, 
the dune, <coughs> the dune uh, then uh, builds itself up uh, under natural conditions. Uh, under conditions where people are trampling, trampling the seagrass or, or off-road vehicles are, are trampling the seagrass or developers are, are uh, building, on, uh, <coughs> building on the dunes, uh, you have a much more rapid rate of, of dune loss and uh, increased instability. Uh, this house is no longer in place. This house uh, has fallen in to, uh, uh, <clears throat> fallen over the cliff in response to a storm that kept chipping away at the base of, of, of this uh, large dune. And many barrier islands also have a phenomenon where they have a freshwater lens uh, of uh, groundwater that sits on top of the underlying seawater, which is, is denser. So that most people <clears throat> on barrier islands as well as on Cape Cod get their water supply from this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, groundwater lens that is extremely vulnerable to contamination. Uh, and why would that be? Because it's just basically a, a, a huge sand pile. So anything that is deposited on the surface can easily migrate beneath the surface. So <clears throat> in, in uh, Cape Cod, they've now done a storm vulnerability analysis, which they've done throughout the United States and tried to figure out uh, what the best response might be. In some areas, they, the uh, Park Service tried to use riprap, uh, which are uh, big blocks of stone that they put against a, uh, the, uh, uh, <coughs> the edge between the, the, the beach and, and the sand dunes, and they found that that was not a good idea because uh, uh, hurricanes and uh, northeasters could pick up those stones and basically uh, uh, chew right through the, uh, the barrier island using the, the stones that pushes the, the, uh, the waves push the stones right through the, the sand. So many people uh, have started building their houses on stilts uh, or uh, refitting stilts uh, and, and uh, the underlying infrastructure uh, <coughs> that uh, uh, would be more survivable. And uh, many don't also understand that uh, during periods of intense storms uh, that these barrier islands want to uh, basically uh, be cut into segments so that uh, uh, they get overwashed uh, and then as the bays behind them fill up, uh, the tide goes down and the water shoots out of the, the bay and cuts across. Uh, here's a good example of a, a house on Cape Cod uh, that was built on a barrier <clears throat> and <clears throat> the, uh, the individual uh, when he found that his house was floating in the middle of, of uh, the bay, he, he uh, got his uh, boat out and he went out and he put a chain through his door and his window uh, and dragged the house back to the shoreline, uh, hired a crane operator to come in and pick the house up, put it on a tra tractor trailer and dragged it back out and put it back exactly where it was on the beach. Uh, and the U.S. federal government through the, the flood insurance program uh, paid for the entire cost. So, Here's another good example uh, of the, the dynamic character of a barrier <clears throat> where the sands are literally blowing through an oak forest uh, up on Cape Cod. So that uh, a, naturally, uh, a natural condition uh, is, is, is a rare condition uh, for a barrier and the, uh, the estuary that it, that it harbors in the United States now because of the intensity of development and, and the incentive that people have had to to try to uh, make money by investing in property in this era. Fire Island National Seashore, by the way, is only about 35 miles to the south of us here. Uh, and it's a pretty good example of, portions of it are a good example of a barrier island. And in 1963, two years after the Cape Cod National Seashore was created, the Fire Island National Seashore and Wilderness Area was created. So I bet you didn't know that uh, you were within 35 miles of uh, a wil federally designated wilderness area. Uh, <coughs> now, if you live in a coastal area, one way of securing your own protection uh, is to try to capture uh, the sediment, the sand that's moving along the coastline. So people, you can imagine that uh, uh, this coastline was, was straight and uh, you imagine that uh, the first property owner in this case decided, you know, <clears throat> my beach is eroding. I'm going to, uh, and supposing that this was the area that he, he was uh, 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 particularly concerned about, uh, my beach is eroding, I'm going to build a, a jetty that will actually capture that sand as it's being pushed along the shoreline, which he did. Well, if you're going to capture sand in one area, you're going to create a deficit in the next area. Uh, so that, that, that is the phenomena, this, this accretion and, and deficit uh, effect of building a jetty explains why you have everybody uh, basically doing the same thing. And uh, I, I was flying over the Connecticut shoreline uh, last weekend, and uh, you can see these jetties uh, side by side uh, uh, all along the uh, New Haven, the Milford, uh, East Haven, uh, Brantford shoreline. Very, very interesting phenomenon, but very expensive to maintain. 
to build and to maintain. And here's another example of, of how to uh, capture sand. That's the uh, Massachusetts Beach Buggers Association, uh, Beach Buggy Association, that uh, is planting sprigs of seagrass sea uh, in an effort to, uh, to rebuild the dune. And it actually works. Uh, by, by planting these sprigs of grass, they, they can uh, cause a, a, a dune system to uh, res be become restored uh, within a matter of a couple of years. So the, the, the Cape Cod formula was also applied to Fire Island. And uh, the one key element of this legal strategy was that uh, if governments at the local level did not adopt the zoning restrictions that the Park Service wanted for those more developed communities, then the federal government had the authority to use eminent domain to go in and just take over the land. So it was a, a carrot and a stick idea, in a way. If the local government did not adopt the standards to protect the, the uh, ecological uh, values of, of these barrier islands, then the federal government would go in and use eminent domain. Interesting kind of combination. There's Fire Island. Looking down Fire Island, parts of it are r rather intensely developed. Uh, quarter acre houses, sometimes tenth of an acre houses, and uh, the underlying aquifer in this case uh, was polluted, requiring them to uh, uh, drill much deeper wells uh, to provide a community water supply. I'm going to scoot ahead here, another uh, example. Here is an example uh, of, of uh, a bunch of, of fairly expensive houses uh, sitting on the shore of Fire Island. And uh, because these are extremely vulnerable to, to uh, storms, uh, it's very common for this first row sitting right on the beach uh, to be wiped out, to be flooded out, uh, which is kind of interesting because it, it causes a, a, an instant uh, shift in property value on a barrier when the first line gets wiped out. So here's uh, another shot. Uh, of a, an area nearby, when you can see uh, the, the former house, house uh, locations marked out uh, by uh, these boundaries, uh, so that all of a sudden these become shorefront and uh, uh, accrue a, a terrific increase in, in property value. Uh, another example of a property rights mixture uh, on Fire Island is the Point of Woods Association, where <clears throat> uh, the land is owned by a, a collective, a corporation, uh, that then leases out the right to, to uh, take over one of the houses in the community uh, for a specific period of time. It could be 50 years, it might be 75 years, and these lease rights are often passed on down among family members. So that this has been an effective strategy on, uh, in this case to protect the common space, the, the open land in, in the middle. By the way, you see also an example here of, of basically creating a seawall on the bay side uh, that uh, would offer protection uh, for, for the houses that were built here. But to do that, they basically had to dredge out the material here and dump it on, <coughs> on uh, uh, other marshland in order to create this, this um, developable, developable property. Uh, another example on Fire Island, if you look at the little dot up there at the end, the Fire Island Lighthouse, uh, it's funny, I, I flew right over this uh, the other day, uh, the Fire Island Lighthouse is, uh, was built right on the end of this spit. And you can see uh, back in 1834 uh, that it was close to the end. Uh, by uh, 1909, uh, the, the spit had extended uh, several hundred yards. Uh, and <clears throat> today, uh, the, the spit is almost uh, four, four and a half miles uh, beyond the, the lighthouse. So that not only do these barrier islands want to roll toward the, the, the mainland, but they also want to extend themselves in the same direction of the, the, uh, the, the uh, prevailing uh, uh, flow, the pr prevailing currents. Another uh, couple of examples, uh, pre and, and post storm, uh, and, and uh, uh, this was uh, Hurricane Rita, and uh, some of these were taken down on, on uh, uh, the Texas coastline, the Padre Island area. Uh, Padre Island is an interesting uh, additional example of a national seashore. Uh, so that uh, keep your eye, in this case, uh, on the structure, which is right about there. So this is pre-storm, uh, and this is post-storm. Another example of high-rise buildings. Uh, again, think about this. High-rise building sitting on top of a big sand pile, uh, <coughs> structurally rather unstable, pre-storm uh, and post-storm. And in this case, you can see in the background, uh, there's almost no damage uh, to, to uh, the properties that are, are, are on the uh, uh, bay side of the barrier island. Another example, pre-storm, 
and post-storm. Pre-storm and post-storm. This case is interesting. Uh, here's a shorefront owner uh, who was surprised to find that he was now a corner lot. So that <coughs> this is a, a terrific example of, of the way that uh, a barrier can get overwashed and then the, uh, the tidal flux causes the, uh, the water inside the channel just to saw back and forth. And this occurred, interestingly, on uh, uh, Nauset Beach in, in Chatham, in Cape Cod. Uh, so that uh, one of these uh, uh, little inlets uh, was created by a storm, a northeaster, and uh, the sawing action of the, of the tides and the currents uh, and additional storms caused the inlet to expand to uh, be more than a mile in width and the, the, the bay front that uh, lay behind it uh, suddenly became ocean front. Uh, and the, the, the new ocean front landowners uh, were really upset because uh, they now faced uh, increasing risk of storm damage. So they went to uh, the, the state of, of uh, Massachusetts and they also went to the Corps of Engineers and said, you know, you've got to step in and you've got to offer us protection. Uh, we're, we're too vulnerable. Our property is vulnerable to loss. And uh, it caused, <coughs> now that they were no longer a bayfront, but they were oceanfront, uh, their, their uh, shorefront was eroding away and, and their property was being threatened. And the Corps of Engineers and the state of Massachusetts uh, said, no, we're sorry. Uh, this, is a, this is a natural process uh, uh, that uh, we are not going to step in to intervene. So that the U.S. government has stopped building these seawalls and stopped building these jetties to capture sand uh, to, uh, to protect private ownerships. Very interesting. Uh, uh, outcome that has attracted a lot of litigation, uh, pre-storm and post-storm. So <clears throat> I'm going to have to shoot ahead here. Uh, let me close by just saying that the, the, the central questions that uh, one would ask uh, about the best way to manage property in the coastal zone uh, include these. Uh, should the land be held in public ownership or private ownership? Uh, if, you, if the land is currently in private ownership, how should it be taken into public ownership? Uh, should, uh, should the land be uh, uh, regulated? Uh, that's a much cheaper solution than going, up and, and going in and buying up the land uh, using the power of eminent domain uh, or purchasing the land from a willing seller. Uh, how should we structure our insurance programs? Uh, how are we going to uh, uh, manage the, the tension that exists between the high property value in the coastal zone uh, that provides the, the fuel to developers to want to go in and, and develop uh, uh, intensively that creates this public liability. Uh, <clears throat> what is the uh, uh, requirement uh, to, to uh, provide compensation uh, when uh, regulation is being used to protect one public good or many public goods, access to uh, recreational opportunities, uh, the, the important uh, nursery characteristic for commercial fisheries, uh, the ecological value of, a, of a, an estuary to store floodwaters uh, so that uh, uh, if an estuary is filled up then it just means the floodwaters are going to move someplace else. So that there are clear benefits associated with regulating development in the coastal zone. Uh, so that if you set those regulations up, should you also have to compensate the private landowner uh, uh, to, uh, uh, if, if, if uh, he claims or she claims that uh, their property value has been diminished? Uh, so that uh, these are the uh, uh, kind of conflicting and competing values that uh, exist in the coastal zone. Okay, that's it for today. Have a great weekend. Enjoy the weather.